Hi everyone, welcome to Holly Lolly channel. Today we're going to look at the pros and cons of living in Japan. We'll kick off with the disadvantages. The first thing I want to talk about is the Japanese tax system. As you probably know, taxes here are very high. If, for instance, the average salary in Tokyo is around $2,500, then be prepared for $500 of this amount to go to taxes, leaving a net of $2,000. I've also recently learned about Japan's pension system and I'd like to share this information. The country is facing a serious demographic challenge, with an aging population and a declining birth rate leading to a shortage of workforce, people who are available for work. And in Japan, the amount of pension you get is based on the number of people who are working and paying into the pension system. The law says you have to work in Japan for at least 40 years to get a state pension. Just think, you'd have to work for at least 40 years. For instance, if someone has worked abroad for 20 to 30 years and relocates to Japan, their previous experience is not taken into account. In Japan, you have to start from scratch, regardless of how many years of experience you have already gained. For instance, if I were to get a job in Japan, my previous experience wouldn't be taken into account. This means that the fact that I've already worked for many years in another country wouldn't matter at all. I'd have to work here for at least 40 years to get a pension. I laugh that I may not live to see those years, but who knows? There's a shortage of young workers in the country at the moment, so the amount of money the younger generation puts into the budget for retirees is getting less and less. My teacher's grandfather, for instance, receives a pension of $3,000, so he retired when there were a lot more young people in the country. Her father already gets it's half as much to the tune of $1,500. Of course, you can live in Tokyo on this money, but not as well as her grandfather receives his pension. She thinks that things will get worse over time, and when she retires, her pension will be around $500. It certainly makes you think. It seems like Japan is making a lot of progress in a number of areas, but unfortunately it's having difficulty dealing with the demographic crisis. Even though the government offers payments to young mothers and a range of other benefits, it seems that these aren't enough to cover all the costs of child care and upbringing. In this regard, our countries are in a better position than Japan. On top of having worked at least 40 years to receive pension payments, you also need to pay about 16,000 yen a month to the pension fund. If, for instance, a woman takes maternity leave, these years aren't counted in her pension record. When she goes back to work, she'll have to make up for the time she spent at home raising her child by working longer to get the necessary seniority. As for the retirement age, it's 65 for both men and women. You can retire a little earlier, at 60 but then your pension will be reduced by a quarter. And if you work for another five years, say, up to 70, then your pension will be 25% higher. One of the less appealing aspects of living in Japan is the rubbish situation. I'm sure you've heard that rubbish in Japan is sorted. The number of sorting categories can vary from one area to another, ranging from four to nine. Yes, and if you live in another country, it's probably very easy. You just take out the rubbish when you want to do it. When the rubbish accumulates, you just go out and take it out. For us, it's a whole event, oh my god, I can take out the rubbish today, get rid of the bad smell. Sometimes it's just nice to get rid of things or rubbish that you have nowhere to store because Japanese flats are very small. By chance, I recently learned something that was a real eye-opener. I recently learned that the Japanese have a concept called rubbish suicide. That does sound pretty scary, doesn't it? What exactly is it? It's when people end up with more and more rubbish at home and then, at some point, they just can't get rid of it. So, the person doesn't throw away the rubbish. At some point, there comes a tipping point where it's simply impossible to throw it all away. People have these huge piles of rubbish at home. They can be in the living room, on the balcony, or even in a room that you have to go through to get to the other side of the house. Some people even make tunnels to get from room to room. What's the reason for this happening? There's a set schedule for when things can be taken out and disposed of. For instance, burnable rubbish that smells bad can be taken to the rubbish truck twice a week on certain days before 8 a.m. But, for example, life has a way of throwing different circumstances our way. You might need to travel to another city, or you may have a job or other commitments that take you away. Or maybe you just forgot what day it was and missed the rubbish collection. In that case, you'll have to store the rubbish at home until the next scheduled collection. Some items can only be taken out once a month, while others can be taken out once every two weeks. And, goodness, you have to remember it all, write all these dates down, though you have a lot of other things to do in your life. So, you got caught up in everything else and forgot about the rubbish day. It's going to have to wait another two months, or rather, two more weeks. And you take it out somewhere, like on the balcony. It's great that in our CIS countries, there are storage rooms and flats, so you can stash away your winter stuff in summer, for example. Here, that's not really an option. Flats in Japan are pretty small and you have to 
store rubbish in your living space, but there's also bulky rubbish and electronics. Unfortunately, there is no free disposal option for these items. You can only dispose of it for a fee. Many people simply don't have the funds to pay for this. Just picture this, you've got two options. Either you splash out on a new pair of shoes because your old ones are worn out and you need something to keep your feet warm, or you pay the same amount of money to get rid of an old TV, a toaster or something else that's broken. You can't just dispose of these items in the usual way here, you have to pay for it instead. You buy rubbish collection. First, you pay for it, agree on a day the car will come to pick up your rubbish, put a sticker on the item to confirm you've paid, and put it in a special place. Then, the car will come and pick it up. You can't just get rid of it like that. And because each type of equipment has to be properly disposed of and paid for, people don't have the money for it, so they end up accumulating all this rubbish in their flats. I'm all for sorting rubbish. In fact, did you know that the whole island of Adaiba was built thanks to the accumulated rubbish? It was recycled properly, staffed and made a lot of useful and good things. However, it's still an extra hassle when it becomes your second job. By way of an example, I'm someone who lives in Japan and who sorts the rubbish. I wash all the cans after I've finished eating and before I throw them away. I remove all the labels and sort the lids separately. On top of that, if I could just throw it away whenever I want, I think it would be a nice bonus. If I could just put it in a special bin and throw it away whenever I want. But that's not the case here. I think this is also a significant global issue. People invest a lot of time in this probably a few hours a week, a few hours of our lives. We spend a lot of time sorting and organizing everything properly. We usually get a lot of parcels and deliveries. When a box arrives, you have to take it apart, pack it up, and then put SLL your boxes into another box or a bag. All these boxes have to be sorted by the right size, and you have to tape them up with paper tape only and tamp them down properly. I remember a situation occurring. Tomorrow is rubbish day, and I was frantically searching the konbini for paper tape because I didn't have anything to bind the boxes with. I couldn't find what I needed anywhere, so I ordered it from Amazon. The Amazon delivery didn't arrive until the next day, and I didn't have time to take the boxes out. I had to put the trash removal on hold because I didn't have the paper tape to properly pack everything up. I ended up storing those boxes on the balcony. I think this is a significant and very relevant issue in Japan. When I'm abroad, I love being able to put all the rubbish in bags and take it out when it gets in my way, not when I need it. I hope you understand. Another drawback for me is the lack of privacy in Japan. Are you wondering why? So, what actually happens? When you come to Japan and rent a place, you quickly realize that the walls are very thin. It's like living in a cardboard box. So, there's this wall, and behind it is the next room. It's like you're just living in a wardrobe with doors opening and closing all the time. There aren't any latches or locks anywhere. If I were to slide a wall to the right, my sister would be there, and my kids would be behind this one. I also found out why Japanese houses don't have the standard doors we're used to. In fact, for generations they've been used to living in one space with all the different generations of the family together, grandparents, parents, children. So basically, all these walls are pushed apart to make one big room. And that's their tradition. I think it's important to respect their traditions. However, I'm surprised that these traditions are still so widespread. If I sneeze in this room, people can hear it in the last room on the other side. I'm saying it as if we had 10 rooms here. We don't. But anyway, no matter what you say or do, everyone around you can still hear you. Let's take a basic work call as an example. I'm on a call, I've got some work to do, and then my kid comes in and asks, Mom, you said this word, what does it mean? It's not a bad word, it's nothing like that, it's just a work term. I explain it to him, but then I say, look, this is my work call, let's not eavesdrop and do our own thing. And he says to me, but I can hear what you're doing and what you're saying anyway. It's also difficult for me to record videos for the channel because of that. It's not the best idea to film outside because there are a lot of factors that can get in the way. There's a lot of wind, people are walking around, and there are lots of other sounds that get in the way. There aren't any benches around here, either. I went outside after all, thinking I might be able to record a video on the street. But you can see that the wind is pretty strong, and there's nowhere to hide from it. Secondly, there's nowhere comfortable to sit and record the video. I bet you didn't think it would take me 25 to 30 minutes to find this place. There's a small alley here, and as you can see there aren't any benches anywhere else in the area either. I spent a while looking for a bench and ended up wandering into a playground where there were lots of children. It's not the same in Japan as it is in our countries. In our country, any neighborhood will have a playground playground and benches where parents can sit and relax. There aren't many playgrounds here. They're pretty basic, with just a few slides, a couple of swings and a sand pit. There's not much else. 
and there's often a big rush, lots of kids, they take the whole kindergarten group there, on this playground, and they all try to settle into play, and adults are definitely not needed there. One thing to note is that it's not permitted to film the children, and if you just start filming yourself, people tend to look at you a bit strangely. Furthermore, I'm not from around here, a foreigner who's come to the playground for some reason. If you take out your phone, you'll scare everyone away. It took me a while to find a spot that felt comfortable. It took me a while to find this bench. I should mention that there's something written here, which I've translated. It looks like this bench belongs to an office, so I'm not sure if I can sit here. I'm afraid that someone's going to ask me to leave. I also realized that the noise would make a very poor video, so I decided to go back home and record it there, as sound is more important than what you see around me. And, to be honest, there isn't much to see here. That's why privacy issues are a common problem in Japan. People don't have much personal space. I dream of our big, spacious flat with normal doors. It would be great to be able to record videos without even having to look for a moment when no one is home, like when the kids are at school or kindergarten, and you can just switch on music at any moment. For example, it's not possible to listen to music without headphones here. I'm not saying I used to play music very loud in my flat or that all my neighbors listen to it, but I could turn on a speaker. I, for example, enjoy a variety of sports, including Zumba. For those who aren't familiar with it, it's a type of dance fitness. I suppose you could call it that. I can't do it here though, because I think the neighbors will come. Well, they probably won't, given the Japanese sensitivities, but they might call the police. The walls are very thin, so you can hear everything. You can't also sing karaoke at home. You have to go to karaoke bars where you rent a booth and sing there. If you want to dance, there are other places you can do it. That's not something you do at home, though. In Japan, people tend to keep their homes pretty simple, focusing on eating, washing, and sleeping. Unfortunately, there are lots of things you can enjoy at home that I can't do in mine. For instance, I enjoy doing sports like Pilates. One exercise is to lie on your back with your legs up and supported. I don't have a wall to lean on. If I lean on these doors, I think they'll just tear right down because they're so thin. And all the walls here are a bit wobbly like that. The next disadvantage is that you have to say goodbye to many of your favorite products here in Japan. For example, there are practically no hard cheeses here, well, there are very few of them, and they have a completely different flavor. Why is that? Because Japan is a mountainous country, 80% of Japan is mountains and the people live on the other 20%, so there's not a lot of land to farm. And given the choice between raising cows for milk or cows for meat, the Japanese prefer to raise cows for meat. So there is milk but often it is not milk in its natural form, but a dairy product containing 30 to 40% milk. And cheese tastes different here, as do sausages. For example, boiled sausage that we also call doctor's sausage, which is very popular in our countries, or good quality summer sausage, there are no such things here. Lovers of sweets will also have a hard time. For example, you can't find the kinders that we are used to here. We order milka from Amazon, but again, you have to make the effort, go to the website, order it, wait for it to come to you, and you can't just go out and buy it in the shop. There is also no Raffello. There are very, very many sweets here but they are Japanese, local, and the ones we are used to are not sold here. For example, I love milk chocolate. You can't get that here. I've even found salted chocolate, but not milk. The Japanese in general like to mix different flavors, especially incompatible ones. Sometimes it's really, really enjoyable. Sometimes it's kind of incomprehensible to me. But the standard flavors are not so easy to find. They don't sell cottage cheese here either. It's the frosted cheesecakes, the sweet ones, that I really love. You know, for some reason I started loving them in Japan when they're not available here, when they're hard to get. For example, there's a shop in Tokyo that sells foreign goods. It takes me more than an hour to get there. But if you really want something, you can go there. Or if you're in the area on business. But you still can't always find what you want, because popular products sell out quickly. So it's quite difficult here with products that we are familiar with. But of course there are many other things that we never even dreamed of. The other thing to keep in mind is that your driving license won't be valid in Japan, and neither will your international license. I know some foreigners who have managed to come to Japan and use car sharing, rent a car and drive on their international license. Just remember, that's not something you can do in Japan. If you get stopped by the traffic police, they'll either give you a fine or, since the Japanese are quite loyal, they might let you off if you chat with them for a while, explain your situation and apologize for not knowing the law. Sometimes they'll make an exception and just give you a warning, and 
ask you to change your license anyway. It's not as easy as it seems, either. If you want to change your license, you'll have to retake the exam in a language you understand. That's the fine detail. The first test is taken on a computer, and then you have to pass the practical test. But again, it's not so straightforward here because it can take up to three months to sign up for practice. And, in theory, it can take anything from three to six months to get a new Japanese license. In Japan, they tend to take their time and collect a lot of paperwork. You'll have to fill in a lot of forms. In general, the slogan of all Japanese people is haste makes waste. Another downside that I discovered recently is that washing machines here use cold water. When I went abroad and threw my clothes in the wash, I was very surprised when the colors ran. I guess I just got used to washing in cold water back home in Japan, so I didn't even think about it. And that's how I discovered that my favorite clothes bleed. And conversely, there are things I couldn't get clean in Japan, like some stains on the sleeves. In Japan, you have to soak and scrub such items with soap for a long time before putting them in the washing machine because cold water doesn't clean anything. But abroad, they came out clean easily just in the washing machine, like after a dry cleaning, because they were finally washed in hot water. I laugh and say that I've already forgotten what it's like to wash clothes in hot water when you don't need to pre-wash them by hand before putting them in the washing machine. Here, of course, everything is washed very gently but it doesn't clean well at all. So in Japan, you need to pre-soak your clothes if you want them to come out clean and nice after washing. In our countries, in the CIS countries, we don't think about it. We just throw the clothes in the washing machine and they get washed in warm water. So, keep this peculiarity of Japan in mind. I think it's about time we talked about the pros of living in Japan. One of the great things about living in Japan is that you'll have very little conflict over nothing. And also in situations where it seems like there's no way around conflict. Japanese people tend to behave in a pretty predictable way. So you can pretty much guess how this or that person will act. You can relax knowing that nobody will try to embarrass you or cause a scene to resolve a conflict. It's easier for Japanese people to walk away from a conversation and switch to another topic but they won't cause any conflict with you. I'll give you an example. In a public place, you can't even talk on the phone because it's considered rude and uncomfortable for others. The Japanese are generally very considerate and don't want to make others uncomfortable. So, everyone treats each other with a lot of respect. This makes it really comfortable to be here. You can relax, knowing that nobody will say anything bad about you or give you a sideways glance. They may stare at you, some shyly, some not shyly, because you're a foreigner, you're different, and you pique their interest. But but the great thing is that nobody will offend you. Pet cafes are really popular in Japan. These are places where you can socialize with any animals you want. For instance, my husband is allergic to cats, but I adore them. In my home country, not in Japan, I couldn't get a cat because if at least one family member is allergic, you have to live without pets. And in Japan you can go to a special cafe and spend as much time as you like with the cats playing with them. Then you just have to wash your clothes afterwards. And it's great to have such an opportunity to interact with kittens, dogs and other animals, even exotic ones, such as mini pigs. And while it's great to watch the animals at the zoo, there's something special about letting them climb on top of you, petting and touching these cute creatures. It's an indescribable feeling. You can also find chinchillas and rabbits at pet cafes. It's a kind of contact zoo, but in a cozier home atmosphere. Of course, you can also enjoy a drink while petting the animals, and there are even even some books to read. However, for hygiene reasons, I still don't drink while interacting with the animals, although others do. The great thing is you can do it at any time. You know, I said I could do it any time and was a bit unsure. For instance, we tried to get into the Capybara Cafe a few times but only managed to get in on the third attempt because we had to make a reservation in advance. First, we were told to book a table a month in advance. Then, we found a window and booked earlier than that, and we got in. But this only applies to exotic animals you've seen seen on TV or in books. And here you can actually go and touch and pat a capybara live. By the way, it's important to be careful around capybaras because they can bite or hurt you. It's especially important to be careful with children. But at least you have this opportunity. I should also mention that Japan has some pretty unusual lifts. I've moved around a lot in Tokyo and every time I've encountered a different kind of lift. I was always surprised and would ask my acquaintances what it's for and what it means. One day, I saw a chair in the lift and thought, is that just there for people to sit down? I mean, it's a lift, and it's not that far to go in it that anyone would get tired enough to sit on a chair. As it turns out, it's a chair that's for emergencies. So, if someone gets stuck in a lift and has to wait a long time for rescue, it's not just a chance to sit down 
down, rest and avoid sitting on the floor. If you lift the lid on this chair, you'll find that it can be used as a toilet, which is handy if you're stuck there for a while. There's also water and food there for when you need. Japan is prone to various natural disasters, so it's hard to predict when something might happen. That's why it's good to have food, water and this chair, which can double as a seat and a toilet in an emergency. I also noticed a pet button in the lift in one of the houses. If someone goes into the lift with a pet, they just press this button. If the other person, for instance, is allergic to fur or simply doesn't want to be near an animal, they can simply skip the lift. The person in the lift will know there's an animal on board because they'll see the pet's button lit on their floor. In this case, the person will wait until the button is no longer lit and then call the lift. Another thing that sets Japanese lifts apart from ours is the focus on accessibility for people with disabilities. Firstly, all the buttons are duplicated at wheelchair level so that someone in a wheelchair can call the lift independently. I often see that for visually impaired people. The buttons are made so that you can feel the numbers or hieroglyphics by touch. I also noticed that in our house lift, when someone called for an ambulance, the back wall opened in a special way to allow the lift to expand. What was this done for? This was so that the ambulance staff could get a gurney or stretcher into the lift and go up to the right floor and then down. There's also something a bit unusual about the buttons. In some lifts, there's no button 4. The Japanese have a superstition that the number 4 is unlucky, so you'll often find that buildings in Japan don't have a button 4 on their lifts. Instead, you'll see button 3, then button 5, and then there's simply no fourth floor. Even the fourth floor apartments are rented and sold at a lower price than the other floors. Japan is a very accessible country for people with disabilities. Take the pavements, for instance. There are special grooved tiles that people can feel with their shoes, which help them to understand where to go and which way to turn. Before a crossroads, the structure and texture of the grooves change, so you know it's time to stop. You won't find any high curbs in Tokyo that stop wheelchairs getting anywhere. Everything you could possibly need is provided. The same goes for toilets. There's always a toilet for people with disabilities. The same goes for Japanese public transportation transport, which makes it easy and convenient for people with disabilities to get around. I also wanted to mention how well thought out the Japanese subway system is, there is always someone available to help people with disabilities reach their destinations. This person will meet them and guide them where they need to go. By the way, there are elevators everywhere, so if someone cannot use the escalator, they can always use an elevator to go up or down with a wheelchair. A subway employee uses a special ramp to help the wheelchair into a special carriage, and then communicates via radio so that at the destination station, another employee will meet and assist the person to comfortably reach the exit. There's also a special taxi model in Japan designed for people with disabilities who use wheelchairs. Additionally, phone booths are also designed to be accessible for people with disabilities. They are positioned at a height that allows a person with a disability to use them in an emergency to call for necessary services. Kudos to the Japanese authorities, as they address and meet many needs of people with disabilities. For example, if someone needs a motorized wheelchair, the authorities provide it. There is there is also a law in Japan requiring each company to employ a certain number of people with disabilities, calculated based on the total number of employees, and to train and officially employ these individuals. The government also pays for the work of social workers who assist people with disabilities. I've also seen several times where social workers bring a special transport equipped with a bathtub, pumps, and other equipment to bedridden elderly people without children. They bring this bathtub directly into the apartment. I assume they bathe the person and then take all the equipment away. These services visit the person several times a week. Friends, that's all for now. Subscribe to the channel, like the video, and arigato for watching. See you in the next videos, bye bye.